7. Stephen gives the Jewish council types of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament that show that Jesus Christ was Israel's Messiah. He also shows Israel's continuous rebellion against God in the Old Testament to show them that their fathers rejected the types and they have rejected their Messiah in the flesh. Now, God is giving them another chance through the Holy Ghost, and they are still rejecting God by not believing the gospel Jesus taught. When the religious leaders ignore Stephen's speech and kill him, Jesus stands and judges them. Israel's program is set aside, and the dispensation of grace will begin in Acts 9, which is the dispensation that we live in today. 7 colon 1 The charge against Stephen is that he has blasphemed the temple and the law, saying that Jesus will destroy the temple and change the law. 6 colon 13-14 of course, Stephen is upholding God's law covenant with Israel in the face of the Jewish religious leaders, who have rejected God's law so that they can keep their traditions, Mark 7 verse 9. Stephen never answers the high priest's question. Instead, it is God, who, through Stephen, puts Israel on trial. 7 colon 2 The Holy Ghost will now indict the nation of Israel for their unbelief and apostasy from the beginning of the nation up to the present to show Israel why God will now set them aside and begin building the body of Christ through Paul. Primarily, the Holy Ghost focuses upon Moses. The promised land was at hand for Israel in the wilderness, but they rejected Moses. Therefore, they did not enter in. Similarly, the kingdom was at hand for Israel from Matthew through early Acts, but they rejected God the Father, through John the Baptist, God the Son, through Jesus, and God the Holy Ghost, through Stephen. Therefore, they will not enter in. 7 colon 3 Israel still has favored nation status with God, because Israel's program is still going on here, as Stephen points them back to the Abrahamic covenant in Genesis 12 verses 1 to 3, where their favored nation status began. Thus, Jesus did not start something new. He did not abolish the law. He came as the kinsman redeemer of Israel, so that God could fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel of establishing them as the rulers underneath the Lord Jesus Christ in God's eternal kingdom on earth. 7 colon 4 in Genesis 11 verse 1, the whole earth was united against God. They were not divided into nations, but they were under the Babylonian rule of Nimrod, Genesis 10 verses 9 to 10. When the world united in Genesis 11 in rebellion against God, God gave up on the Gentiles, Romans 1, 24, 26, 28, creating one nation through which he would reconcile the earth back to himself. That one nation was the nation of Israel. At the time Stephen is speaking, God is trying to unite the whole world again, but all under God, by eliminating language barriers by again having the world speak just one language, through the Holy Ghost's power to interpret words into other tongues, 2 colon 4, 8, 11. However, this must first start with Israel being saved as a kingdom of priests to reach the nations with the gospel of the kingdom, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6, during the millennial reign, Zechariah 8 verse 23. Thus, Stephen starts at the beginning of God's kingdom program with Israel to show that Israel has been in unbelief regarding what God has told them this whole time. Therefore, God cannot reconcile the earth back to himself through Israel at this time, and so he will begin reconciling the heaven back to himself by beginning the body of Christ in Acts 9. There is an interesting parallel between Abraham's father and the nation of Israel in Acts 7. Genesis 11 verse 31 says that Terah, Abraham's father, left Ur of the Chaldees to go to Canaan. Evidently, he must have done this because God called him to do so. However, Terah served other gods, Joshua 24 verse 2. Therefore, he never made it to Canaan, the promised land, but dwelt in Haran instead, Genesis 11 verse 31. Similarly, God called Israel in early Acts to believe the gospel so that God could bring them into the kingdom, but they refused to believe. Therefore, another generation of Jews, which will spring up after the rapture of the body of Christ, will believe, much like Abraham sprung up after Terah to believe. 7 colon 5 Abraham had a child with Hagar, but God said that that child would not be the heir, because it was not a miraculous birth. Thus, Ishmael was not the child of promise, Isaac was, Galatians 4 verses 22 to 31. This is why God did not give Abraham the land when he was alive. It was a promise to him. 
If he gave him the land when he was alive, Abraham would not have obtained righteousness by faith. He had to trust God that he would fulfill his promise too. Him in the ages to come. This is why Abraham refused to accept a burial plot in the promised land as a gift from Ephron, Genesis 23 verses 11 to 16. He paid for it because the only gift of land he would receive would be from God's promise to him, not a gift of land from man. Therefore, both the land and the seed were promised to Abraham, both of which would be provided by God. 7 colon 640 is the number of probation in the Bible, and 10 is the number of a new beginning. Thus, 40 times 10 is equal to 400 years. God would make a new beginning for the earth after man's probation period was over by bringing Israel into the promised land. Thus, the promise that Israel would be in bondage in Egypt for 400 years, Genesis 15 verse 13. Israel needed to suffer before they would trust in God for the promised land. Similarly, at the time Stephen is speaking this, Israel must suffer through the tribulation period before they will trust God for his kingdom on earth. When Israel came out of Egypt, they did not believe and had to suffer another 40-year probation period in the wilderness. So, too, in Stephen's day, Israel did not believe and has suffered through a probation period of 2,000 years and counting, awaiting their kingdom promises. The writer of Hebrews makes this connection between Israel in the wilderness and Israel in early Acts, while it is said, Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, Hebrews 3 verse 15. 7 colon 7 God judged Egypt for keeping Israel in bondage for 400 years, because God said that he would curse those who cursed Israel, Genesis 12 verse 3. So, too, at the end of the tribulation period, God will judge the apostate nation of Israel for keeping the believing remnant of Israel in bondage to Jewish traditions, instead of following God's law covenant, Matthew 21 verse 43. Malachi 4 verse 1, Matthew 13 verse 30, and John 15 verse 6. 7 colon 8 God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision in Genesis 17 verses 10 to 14 to give Jews a free will choice of being part of God's nation or not. If they are not circumcised, God promises to cut them off, Genesis 17 verse 14. Although they were to be physically circumcised, God is ultimately referring to the circumcision of the heart, Deuteronomy 10 verse 16. If they obey his commands, Deuteronomy 30 verse 2, he will circumcise their hearts, Deuteronomy 30 verse 6, so that they will enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. Stephen's audience has been physically circumcised, but they will not enter God's kingdom because they have not obeyed God's commands, which is to believe the gospel of the kingdom. If they are true children of Abraham, they will have faith plus works and enter God's kingdom, John 8 verse 39. Thus, the covenant of circumcision introduces to Israel the necessity they have to believe the gospel of the kingdom and to do the works of Abraham in order to enter the kingdom. 7 colon 9 Immediately, we see that this covenant of circumcision caused a division within Israel between covenant breakers and covenant obeyers. Even among the twelve men, who are the fathers of the twelve tribes of Israel, we see them in unbelief, save Joseph, before God's law was even given to Moses. Thus, Stephen is going to show that, from the beginning of Israel's existence, there have been these two groups in Israel. The Jewish religious leaders of Stephen's day represent the unbelievers, who will be cast into the lake of fire, John 15 verse 6, while Stephen represents the believing remnant who will rule in God's eternal kingdom on earth, Matthew 5 verse 5. Note also how the patriarchs were moved with envy against Joseph, 7, 9. That is the real reason why apostate Israel persecutes believing Israel, and why Christianity today persecutes Bible believers. Religion drives in the flesh to accomplish what God has freely given us by His Spirit. The culmination of this in Israel's program is the Babylonian religious system under the Antichrist in the Tribulation period and it is all because the flesh lusteth against the spirit, Galatians 5 verse 17. By giving Joseph as an example, Stephen also shows that the believing remnant will never be completely destroyed, because God is with him, regardless of how apostate Israel tries to destroy believing Israel. Thus, God will fulfill his promises to the nation of Israel. 710 Thus 
Apostate Israel afflicted Joseph, the believing remnant, by selling him into Egyptian slavery, but God delivered him out of all his afflictions. The point, then, to Stephen's audience is that apostate Israel may kill him and other members of the little flock, but the Lord will deliver the believing remnant by bringing them into his kingdom. Apostate Israel, who is now trying Stephen, is powerless to stop God. And, since they are subject to God's wrath for killing their Messiah by wicked hands, 2.23, why not believe the gospel and be made governor of God's house in the kingdom, as Joseph was made Pharaoh's governor in Egypt? 7.11 This dearth represents the little flock going through the tribulation period. They will find no sustenance during that time, except for what God provides to them, Revelation 12 verse 14, because they will not take the mark of the beast, Revelation 13 verses 16 to 17. Therefore, they cannot buy food. 7.12-15 Israel came to Egypt the first time for physical food, and they did not recognize Joseph. At their second coming, Joseph was made known to Israel, and Joseph brought Israel into Egypt to live and prosper and be made known to Pharaoh. Similarly, Israel did not recognize their Messiah when Jesus Christ came the first time. They only came to him for physical food, John 6 verse 26. As such, we see the two groups in Israel again the little flock and the rest of Israel. At Jesus' second coming, they will finally recognize him as their Messiah, Zechariah 12 verse 10. Then, Jesus will bring Israel into the promised land to live and prosper and be made known unto God the Father. Joseph is the most complete type of Jesus Christ found in the Bible, as Arthur W. Pink has identified 60 ways in which Joseph was a type of Jesus Christ. A note about Bible contradictions and circular reasoning, one thing that should be mentioned is that 7.14 says that all his kindred were threescore and fifteen souls, but Genesis 46 verse 27 says that all the souls of the house of Jacob, which came into Egypt, were threescore and ten. You can find many so-called contradictions like this in scripture, and people bring up things like this all the time to try to prove that the Bible contains errors. However, Differences like this actually prove that the Bible does not contain errors. The reason is because, if man wrote the Bible, he would have been careful to change one verse or the other to make them both say the exact same thing. However, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him, Hebrews 11 verse 6. It is the glory of God to conceal a thing, Proverbs 25 verse 2. Therefore, many times in Scripture, God will state the same thing twice, but each instance will be just a little different to make it look like there is a contradiction. If you do not want to believe the Bible, you can use these to say that it contains errors, and God will not reward you. However, if you do believe the Bible, you will diligently seek for the answer in Scripture, find why there is a difference, and then God gets the glory for concealing the truth from unbelievers, while revealing it to babes with childlike faith, Luke 10 verse 21. Therefore, instead of appealing to the original Greek and Hebrew and trying to explain the difference, we will simply look at the wording of each passage to discover why there is a difference. Genesis 46 verse 27 says that 70 souls came into Egypt. Acts 7 verse 14 says that all his kindred were 75 souls. Therefore, we can conclude that the extra five would have been people born in Egypt. In other words, 70 souls came into Egypt to make a total of 75 souls, since five of them were born in Egypt, such as Joseph's sons. What is wonderful about Stephen mentioning 75 souls is the very fact that he gave a number that was different from the Old Testament. In other words, Stephen could not have come up with 75 on his own. He must have received this number from the Holy Ghost, which means that the Holy Ghost must have been speaking through Stephen, because only God would have known that all his kindred were 75 souls. Therefore, rather than proving the Bible contains errors, Acts 7 verse 14 proves that Stephen was speaking by the Holy Ghost, which tells us that we can rely upon everything Stephen says as being 100% accurate. Man will say, you can't do that. That is circular reasoning. You have to use extra biblical sources to prove what is correct. That is the most ridiculous statement that can be made. God wrote one book. Man wrote all extra biblical. Sources. Since God's ways and thoughts are higher than man's ways and thoughts, Isaiah 55 verses 8 to 9, 
using extra-biblical sources to test God's word would corrupt his holy word and would be a way of tempting the Lord, which is forbidden by scripture, Deuteronomy 6 verse 16. Since man wrote down, word for word, exactly what God told him to write down, 2 Peter 1 verses 20 to 21, man did not put any thought into the scripture. As such, man is to God what a parrot is to man. If you walked into my house and heard my parrot say, my name is Eric, you may want to know if the parrot's name is Eric or my name is Eric. You would not say within yourself, I think I will ask other parrots to get verified, independent stories so that I know for sure who is named Eric. The reason is because parrots cannot think to tell you what I told the first parrot, even though these other parrots may have heard me talk to the first parrot. Similarly, you would not go to man to find out what God wrote in his word, because man is not capable of thinking on God's level. You have to go to God to find out what he said in his word, because man does not think on God's level, just like parrot does not think on man's level. The only way a parrot can say what a man says is if a man tells the parrot what to say, and the only way a man can understand what God says is if God tells him what he said. And, since there is only one God, Isaiah 45 verses 5 to 6, and he only wrote one book, you must go to God's word to find out what God said and have the Holy Ghost, who is God, teach you the meaning of it. 1 Corinthians 2 verses 9 to 14. And, since God's word is true, John 17 verse 17, God cannot lie, Titus 1 verse 2, and God has promised to preserve his word forever, Psalm 12 verses 6 to 7 and Matthew 24 verse 35, down to the very letter of every word in the Bible, Matthew 5 verse 18. You do not need to worry that man has somehow corrupted God's word and you do not need any other sources to verify its accuracy. God's word today in the English language in the King James Version is 100% accurate without error and is just as accurate as the original manuscripts written thousands of years ago, all because God says this is so. Case closed. Seven sixteen. Abraham bought a burial plot, rather than allowing it to be given to him, because the only gift of the promised land that he would accept would be from God, as he had promised him, Genesis 23 verses 13 to 16. This burial plot was a sign of Israel being in the land, since Isaac, Sarah, Rebekah, Abraham, Jacob, and Leah were buried there, forming the acrostic Israel, when El Shaddai, the Almighty God, is put in the place of Jacob, Genesis 49 verse 31. Thus, the burial plot in Canaan was a witness to Israel during the 400 years in Egypt that God would bring them back into the land, as he had promised their fathers. 7 17-19 When the time to enter the promised land was at hand, another king arose after the Pharaoh that Joseph was under and, through subtlety, got Israel to kill their own children. Similarly, with the kingdom of heaven being at hand at the time Stephen is speaking, see Matthew 3, 2, 4, 17, and 10, 7, another king, i.e., the Antichrist, will arise and, through subtlety, get Israel to lose their place in God's kingdom by taking the mark of the beast or worshipping his image. 7, 20-21 Moses is a type of Jesus, as well. Exodus 2 verses 2-3 Moses was raised by his mother for three months, but then had to cast him out, because he was too big to hide, Exodus 2 verses 2 to 3. Similarly, Jesus was cast out by the Jews at his first coming after being received by them for three years, his earthly ministry, but will later come back to lead Israel out of bondage to Satan. After Moses was cast out by his Jewish mother, a Gentile, Pharaoh's daughter, accepted him. In between Jesus' two comings, the Gentiles are reconciled back to God in this current dispensation of grace. Of course, this latter parallel can only be seen in hindsight since the dispensation of grace was a mystery until revealed to Paul in Acts 9. 7, 23-25 At Moses' first coming to deliver Israel, he killed one who had oppressed Israel, thinking that Israel would have understood how that God by his hand would deliver them but they understood not, 725. Similarly, at Jesus' first coming to deliver Israel, Jesus bound Israel's oppressor, Satan, so that Israel could go free, Matthew 12 verse 29 and Isaiah 49 verses 24 to 25. 
But Israel rejected their Redeemer, because they understood not that God, by his hand would deliver them. 3 colon 14 dash 17 7 colon 26 dash 28 Moses was not some arrogant Jew, who was mad at the Egyptians, and got ahead of God's plan for his life, as Christianity would have you believe. Rather, he was chosen by God from birth to be Israel's deliverer, Exodus 2 verse 2 and Hebrews 11 verse 23. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Hebrews 11 verse 27. By killing the Egyptian oppressor. Since he did this by faith, God's will was for him to kill the Egyptian oppressor, because God was ready to deliver Israel right then. Therefore, he showed himself to Israel the day after killing the oppressor to set them at one again, 726. This was Israel's chance to be delivered by God through Moses. Instead, Israel was in unbelief and said, Who made thee a ruler and a judge over us? 727. Thus, Israel had to wait 40 more years for Moses to come back to deliver them. Similarly, Jesus forsook the Jewish religious system, not fearing the wrath of the Pharisees. He then showed himself to Israel after his resurrection, and they would not let God rule over them. Therefore, they will now have to wait until after the dispensation of grace is over before Jesus will come back to deliver them. 729 Moses did not flee because he was afraid of the Hebrews. After all, he had just killed an Egyptian and was not afraid of what the king would do to him. Rather, the reason Moses fled was because he saw Israel's unbelief, which meant they were not ready to be delivered from their oppressors. Therefore, he chose rather to suffer affliction with the people of God, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Hebrews 11 verse 25 God's people were not the Jews in Egypt, because they were in unbelief. Therefore, he fled to Median, where the true people of God were. Similarly, Jesus did not have his ministry in Jerusalem where the center of Judaism was, because they were in unbelief, as shown by them putting John the Baptist in prison, Matthew 4 verse 12. Instead, he had his ministry in Galilee of the Gentiles, where the true people of God were, Matthew 4 verses 15 to 17. 7.30 The flame of fire in a bush appeared, showing that Israel would only have the faith to enter the promised land by going through the trials of the wilderness, since they rejected their deliverer at first. Similarly, the fiery trials of the tribulation period are the only way Israel will recognize Jesus as their Messiah and enter the promised land at the end of the tribulation period, Malachi 3 verses 2 to 4, since they rejected their Messiah at first. Thus, burning bush, and not the star of David, is Israel's national symbol, since Israel will only be saved by fiery trials, Romans 11 verse 26. 731 Moses only hears the voice of the Lord when he is close to the fiery bush. Similarly, Israel will only hear the voice of the Lord in his word and repent when they go through the fiery trials of the tribulation period. 732 God identifies himself as the God of Israel, even though Israel has not heard from him for 400 years. Similarly, at his second coming, Jesus Christ will identify himself as the God of Israel, even though they have not heard from him for 2,000 years and counting. Moses does not recognize God until he appears in the fiery bush, just like God will be in the fiery trials of the tribulation period, but Israel will not recognize him as such until the end. Daniel 3 verse 25, Zechariah 12 verses 9 to 10. Moses recognized him as God by his voice, just like Israel will believe when they hear his voice, John 10 verse 16. 733 Moses was on holy ground because God was there, and God is holy, 1 Peter 1 verse 16. Moses taking off of his shoes signifies how Israel must take off their clothing of religion, Genesis 3 verses 7 and 21, and have their sins atoned for by the blood of Jesus Christ in order to enter the promised land for Jesus' eternal reign on earth because unholy man cannot dwell in the presence of a holy God. 734 Moses' second coming to Israel in Egypt to deliver them will result in their deliverance, because they were not ready for him at his first coming. Similarly, Israel will not be delivered from their bondage to sin until Jesus' second coming, because they were not ready for him at his first coming. The two comings are seen by God saying, I have seen, I have seen, 734.
He saw Israel's affliction 40 years prior. That is why God put it into Moses' heart to visit his brethren, the children of Israel, then, 723. But, Israel was in unbelief. Therefore, they were not delivered then. God saw Israel's affliction again, 40 years later, and sent Moses a second time. 735, just like God sent the same Moses to Israel a second time, God will send the same Jesus to Israel a second time to bring them into the kingdom. This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. 111. 736 Note what it took to bring Israel into belief under Moses. They had to see wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness forty years. 736. Similarly, in order to bring Israel into belief under Jesus, Israel will have to see wonders and signs in Jerusalem, spiritual Egypt, from Matthew through early Acts, and in the tribulation period, the spiritual Red Sea, and in the dispensation of grace, the spiritual wilderness. 737 Stephen has already shown the Jewish religious leaders many parallels between Moses and Jesus Christ. Therefore, Stephen has already clearly demonstrated that Jesus Christ is the prophet like God that God promised, in Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, to send to the nation of Israel. In that prophecy in Deuteronomy, God then goes on to say that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him, Deuteronomy 18 verse 19. Since Israel did not hearken to Jesus' words, Stephen is showing the Jewish religious leaders that they are presently under the wrath of God. So, again we see the two groups in Israel, one, the little flock, who hears the prophet and is saved, and two, apostate Israel, who will not hear the prophet and has incurred God's wrath, as a result. 738 Christianity says that the church started in Acts 2. However, this verse says that the church was in the wilderness during Moses' day. This shows that the word church does not mean four walls and a roof. Rather, it simply means a group of believers. More importantly, this also shows that what God started with Abraham was still continuing at this time. God did not start something new with Jesus in the book of Matthew, nor did he start something new at Pentecost in Acts 2. Rather, he is still continuing the same program of reconciling Israel to himself so that Israel may be a kingdom of priests to reach the Gentiles with the gospel of the kingdom in the millennial reign. 739 While it is true that Israel continued to follow Moses physically in the wilderness, this verse points out that, in their hearts, they were back in Egypt. In other words, in spite of their cries to God for deliverance from affliction in Egypt, because of their unbelief and their sin nature, they would rather be in affliction in Egypt, following the lusts of their flesh, than to be in God's land obeying God's law. Similarly, Israel would rather be in affliction under the Romans than to believe that Jesus is their Messiah and allow him to lead them into God's kingdom on earth. 7 colon 40-41 God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, but Israel says that Moses brought them out. We see this today in Christianity, where people put their pastors or some Christian leaders in the place of God. Then, when that pastor sins, they forsake God. Here, Israel forsakes God because Moses has been gone from them too long. Similarly, in the tribulation period, many in Israel will align themselves with the Antichrist and worship his image because they follow man instead of God. Also, note that Israel told Aaron to make us gods, 740. Do you realize how ridiculous that sounds? God is greater than man. God made man in his image, Genesis 1 verse 26. Man cannot make God, since man is lower than God. But, it is because man wants to be higher than God that he creates his own gods. Since he is the creator now, he can rejoice in the works of his own hands, 741 by making up his own rules, following the lusts of his flesh, while easing his guilty conscience by supposedly worshipping a higher power. 7 colon 42-43 Exodus through Deuteronomy does not record Israel physically bowing down to idols that represent the host of heaven as they wandered through the wilderness. That is why Amos 5 verses 25 to 27 is quoted here to prove that.
still continuing at this time. God did not start something new with Jesus in the book of Matthew, nor did he start something new with Pentecost in Acts 2. Rather, he is still continuing. Continuing the same program. Seven forty four God dwelt in the tabernacle in the wilderness as a witness against Israel, and they still rebelled against God. So, too, the Holy Ghost dwells in Stephen and the rest of the little flock here, and Israel is still rebelling against God. Seven forty five All modern translations change this verse to read Joshua rather than Jesus as they also do in Hebrews 4 verse 8. Jesus is the correct translation, because Jesus is the Greek for the Hebrew name Joshua. Also, mentioning the name Jesus shows you that he was the real one bringing Israel into the promised land. As such, this reminds Stephen's audience that Joshua was a type of Jesus, which is what Stephen is showing here anyway. He is showing that these Old Testament people and what they went through were all types so that Israel could better understand that Jesus Christ is their Messiah, fulfilling, not just specific Old Testament prophecies, but also being a full fulfillment of Israel's deliverers throughout her history. The good aspects of each of these Old Testament characters, then, are seen in the Lord Jesus Christ's earthly ministry. Also, note in this verse that God drove the Gentiles out from Jesus' day unto the days of David in spite of Israel's disobedience of God's law covenant during most of that time. This would be referred to as the sure mercies of David, Isaiah 55 verse 3. It should be seen as no coincidence, then, that the fulfillment of the sure mercies of David, 1334, is seen in Jesus Christ's resurrection because it is Jesus' resurrection power that will finally give Israel the land, even though they were in unbelief at the time. 7 46 47 God did not allow David to build him a house, because his hands were bloodied from all the wars he fought for God. 1 Chronicles 22 verse 8 Rather, his son, Solomon, built the house of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ won the battle over Satan on the cross. He will also get bloody at his second coming when he destroys the wicked, Revelation 19 verses 13 to 21. Therefore, Jesus prepares a place for saved Israel in his Father's house in between his first and second comings, John 14 verses 2 to 3. 7 colon 48 dash 50 verses 4 9 and 50 are a quote of Isaiah 66 colon 1 dash 2a. The passage in Isaiah goes on to say that God is not looking for a physical building to dwell in. He is looking to dwell in people, Ezekiel 36 verse 27, and, in Israel's program, he will only dwell in men of a poor and of a contrite spirit who trembleth at my word, Isaiah 66, colon 2b. The ones who just follow religion in their sacrifices, killeth an ox, as if he slew a man, Isaiah 66, colon 3a, according to God. Thus, the Holy Ghost is saying, through Stephen, that the Jewish religious leaders are not God's people. It means nothing that they have a temple and say that they sacrifice to God in it. What matters to God are those who obey God's word, and the Jewish religious leaders fall way short in this category, just like their fathers did. In other words, everything that God has done in Israel's program has led up to this point where God wants to dwell in a temple made without hands and that temple is the saved house of Israel, 1 Peter 2 verse 5. Since God has done everything he needs to do to redeem Israel, it is now up to Israel to have the proper response of faith so that they can be that saved house of Israel for God to dwell in. Since Israel, as a whole, is an unbelief, the Holy Ghost, in 7 colon 51 dash 53, will now indict Israel as being guilty and unworthy for God to dwell in. 751 now. God gives his judgment of apostate Israel. God had tried to draw Israel to himself, not only through his law, but also through the living examples of God that he gave them through men like Abraham, Moses, Joshua, and David. Each one was rejected by God. Then, God himself came in the flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, and he was the full fulfillment of all prophecies regarding the Messiah. However, since Israel rejected the Old Testament types, they also rejected the true Christ. 
Then, God himself dwelt in all believers in the person of the Holy Ghost, and they have again rejected him. They are uncircumcised in their ears in that they do not have the ears to hear God's word, because of their unbelief, John 12 verses 37 to 40. They are also uncircumcised in heart because of their unbelief, and the uncircumcision in heart means that God will not put them under the new covenant, Ezekiel 36 verses 26 to 27. Because they are uncircumcised, God will now cut off their souls from his kingdom, Genesis 17 verse 14. 7 to 52-53 Because of their unbelief, the apostate nation of Israel is of a certain generation that sheds all righteous blood, Matthew 23 verses 35 to 36. Jesus called this generation a generation of vipers, Matthew 23 verse 33. A viper is a picture of the devil, thus, they are children of the devil, John 8 verse 44. It is these children of the devil, who have existed throughout Israel's history, which is why they have persecuted and slain the prophets, betrayed and killed Jesus Christ, and have not kept God's law covenant with them. They persecuted and killed the prophets, they persecuted and killed the just one, 752, the Lord Jesus Christ, and now they are persecuting and killing the little flock. Therefore, God will now set aside Israel's program and start the body of Christ with Paul in Acts 9. 754 Hebrews 4 verse 12 says that the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. In 2 colon 37 dash 38, devout Jews, 2 colon 5, were pricked in their heart, and they believed the gospel and were saved as a result. In 533, religious leaders were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay the apostles. Now, the word of God has so condemned these evil vipers that they are cut to the heart, and they immediately try to kill Stephen. They have absolutely no evidence of any wicked thing that he has done to make him worthy of any punishment, but yet they kill him. That is because the word of God has pierced their souls and found them to be utterly corrupt, and so they want to silence God's voice by killing his messenger. Note, here, that they gnashed on him with their teeth. They literally were biting him, trying to take chunks of flesh out of his body. This is a perfect manifestation of their devilish actions, being children of the devil. Satan split open the body of Judas Iscariot, 118, and now these Jewish religious leaders have become so hardened against God that they are mutilating Stephen with their teeth. 7 colon 55 dash 56 first. We are reminded that Stephen is full of the Holy Ghost so that we know assuredly that what Stephen is about to say is 100% accurate. What he says is that God is judging Israel right now. Note that we are told twice that. Jesus is standing on the right hand of God. In 2 colon 32 35, the Holy Ghost told Israel through Peter that Jesus was sitting on the Father's right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Since Jesus stands up here, that means he is standing up to judge his foes. His foes are Israel, of course, since they, by wicked hands, comma, have crucified and slain Jesus, 2.23. Therefore, the judge standeth, James 5 verse 9, and condemns apostate Israel at this point. The kingdom dispensation, at this very moment, is set aside, and God will begin the dispensation of grace with the calling of Paul in Acts 9. However, instead of killing Israel at this point, Jesus judges their program to be suspended, and he starts a new program so that both Jew and Gentile may be saved by the gospel of grace to reconcile the heavenly places back to himself. Now, I know that Christianity will call me crazy for suggesting such a thing. They say that Jesus is not ending the kingdom dispensation here. Rather, he is standing up to welcome home Stephen, the first Christian martyr. Now, that may give you a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling inside, but we are told this nowhere in scripture. What we are told is that, the Lord standeth up to plead, and standeth to judge the people, Isaiah 3 verse 13. God's word tells us that he would sit until his enemies are made his footstool, and it tells us that, when he stands, he stands to judge his people. Therefore, let us believe God's word over Christianity, which is trying to protect their religious system at the expense of not believing God's word. 
Another point to note is that Stephen could not be the first Christian martyr because the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch 1126. Since it happened in Acts 11, we are in Acts 7, and the last time I checked, 7 comes before 11, Stephen was not a Christian. Rather, he was a member of the little flock of Jewish believers. Another reason we know that Jesus was not just simply standing to welcome Stephen home is because of the reaction of the Jewish religious leaders to what Stephen said. Twice, Stephen said that he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God, 7, 55-56. We are then told, then they cried out with a loud voice, and stopped there. Ears, and ran upon him with one accord, and cast him out of the city, and stoned him, 7, 57-58. These Jewish religious leaders knew that Isaiah 3 verse 13 says that the Lord stands to judge the people, and they knew that is what was happening at that time. So much so, that they ran toward Stephen with their hands upon their ears and killed him as quickly as they could, because they did not want to hear God's judgment against them. If Jesus was just standing to welcome Stephen home, they would have laughed at Stephen's statement and mocked him. However, because Jesus standing meant that they were being judged by God, they immediately silenced Stephen by putting their hands on their ears and by killing him. Although the Jewish religious leaders have rejected the Holy Ghost through Stephen, we noted in 6, 7 that there are probably about 200,000 people in the little flock. So, you may wonder why Jesus would judge Israel with so many believers. The reason is that they are not believers anymore. 6.12 says that the Jewish religious leaders stirred up the people, and the elders, and the scribes, to bring Stephen to the council. This means that most of the little flock switched sides at this point. This is not unlike what happened with the events that surrounded Jesus. When Jesus came into Jerusalem, a very great multitude spread their garments and multitudes, went before Jesus saying, Hosanna to the son of David, Matthew 21 verses 8 to 9. Then, just a few days later, the chief priests moved the people to shout about Jesus, crucify him, crucify him, Mark 15 verses 11 to 15. The same thing happens at the stoning of Stephen. Also, the ones who are left in the little flock at this point are persecuted, causing them to leave Jerusalem, 8, 1. Why? Because Israel has rejected the Holy Ghost three times in early Acts, for 21, 5, 17-18, and 754, and three strikes means they are out. Therefore, God allows the church to be scattered because the Great Commission has ceased, Galatians 2 verse 9. 757 in 424, the little flock lift up their voice to God for God to give them boldness to proclaim the gospel. Here, the Jewish religious leaders cried out with a loud voice to stop the testimony of the Holy Ghost against them. They then stopped their ears. Since they did not have the ears to hear the gospel, they stopped their ears to keep from hearing God's judgment against them. Then, to try to stop God's judgment, they ran upon him with one accord. Their doing so in one accord brings us back to the Tower of Babel, when the whole earth was united against God in rebellion, Genesis 11 verse 4. God had sent the Holy Ghost in Acts 2 to reverse the curse of the Tower of Babel so that the world may be united in one language and one speech again, Genesis 11 verse 1, but this time being united to God. Instead, Israel is in rebellion, such that they are in one accord against God to kill God's man, Stephen. It is obvious from their reaction in this verse that Jesus standing on the right hand of God meant he was saying that God is judging them. Otherwise, there is no need to cry out with a loud voice to drown him out and stop their ears so as not to hear him. God wants to save his people, Israel, and they have, with a loud voice, told him, N.O. 758 The Jewish religious leaders casting of Stephen out of the city equates to casting God out of Jerusalem. Their laying down their clothes at Saul's feet shows that they recognize Saul as their leader. Saul is the Paul, who God later used as the Apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. Dot. When Jesus rode into Jerusalem, a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, Matthew 21 verse 8, honoring Jesus as their king. So, too, laying their clothes at Saul's feet shows that they think of him as their leader. 
and that the stoning of Stephen was something that Saul led them in doing. 8 1. Satan likes to copy God. God sent his Christ, and so now Satan is raising his Antichrist Saul. At this point, Saul is well trained in the Jewish religion, 22, 3, being exceedingly zealous of the traditions of his fathers, Galatians 1 verse 14, and is blameless according to the law, Philippians 3 verse 6. Thus, he looks like a holy man, making him the perfect candidate to be the Antichrist, because he persecutes the church of God beyond measure, Galatians 1 verse 13. Thus, too. Snuff out the growth of the little flock in Jerusalem, Satan has raised up Saul as his Christ for all of Israel to follow instead of the true Christ. 759 This is the Jews' third strike against the Holy Ghost. The first was in 4, 17, 21 when the Jewish religious leaders threatened the apostles. The second was in 540 when they beat the apostles. Now, they are killing Stephen, which is the third strike. In Matthew 12 verses 31 to 32, Jesus said that the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost would not be forgiven. The reason is that, after rejecting God the Father and God the Son, once they reject God the Holy Ghost, there is not another member of the Godhead left to reject. Israel has now committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. Therefore, Israel's program, started by God in Genesis 12, is now set aside and God will begin a new program of salvation to all men to make up the body of Christ to reconcile the heavenly places back to himself. It is significant that Stephen addresses God here as Lord Jesus. The reason is because Saul would have heard him say this, since he was standing right there, 758. In 9,3-4, Saul is blinded and God says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest, 9,5. Therefore, when Stephen calls God Lord Jesus, he is preparing Saul to understand that Jesus is Lord when Jesus blinds him near Damascus. 7 hours 60 minutes Although Israel has committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost with no forgiveness available to them, Stephen asks for forgiveness for them, just like Jesus did from the cross, Luke 23 verse 34. How can God grant forgiveness when he said that no forgiveness is available? He does so by starting a new program. No forgiveness was available to Israel under the gospel of repent and be baptized for the remission of sins, 238. Forgiveness will now be offered to Israel under the gospel of trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sins, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3-4. Thus, they are condemned under God's earthly program, but God offers them grace to be saved under God's heavenly program the body of Christ. God makes this offer to them first, before giving it to the Gentiles. This is why. Paul goes to the Jews first in the book of Acts, and it is why Paul says that the gospel of Christ is to the Jew first, and also to the Greek, Romans 1 verse 16. Finally, note in this verse that Stephen did not die, but he fell asleep. In other words, he will have eternal life in God's kingdom on earth when God raises him from the dead at Jesus' second coming. Thus, Stephen is not dead, he is only sleeping in Jesus, John 11 verses 11 to 13. 8 With God putting his earthly kingdom on hold, the church is scattered, v1, and the gospel of the kingdom spreads outside of Jerusalem to Samaria, v5, Ethiopia, v26, and other cities, v40. 8 colon 1 Saul's consenting unto Stephen's death shows that he is the leader of the Jews at this point. He is Satan's copycat of the Christ. Thus, he is primed to be Satan's antichrist in the tribulation period. God allows a great persecution to come upon the church in Jerusalem, because the kingdom program is now on hold. Before, they needed to be in one accord to reach the lost sheep of Israel. Now, the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile is down, Ephesians 2 verse 14, and salvation can go to all. Thus, God allows the little flock to be scattered. However, the twelve apostles stay in Jerusalem because God told them to start their ministry in Jerusalem, 1, 8. They do not know about the change in programs, because Paul is not saved until Acts 9. 
Paul is the apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13. God committed the dispensation of grace to the apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, and it was in Paul first that Jesus Christ showed his long-suffering to both Jews and Gentiles as a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. And, right now, Saul is consenting unto Stephen's death, 8 colon 1. Therefore, since Paul is not saved yet, the twelve apostles do not know about the dispensational change yet. Although they do know that Jesus standing on the right hand of God was a significant event in Israel's program, they do not. Yet know that Israel's program has been set aside. Therefore, they continue to follow Jesus' last instructions to them, which was to preach the gospel of the kingdom to the lost sheep of the house of Israel in Jerusalem, which they do, in spite of the persecution that has just taken place. The Holy Ghost is no longer empowering them to fulfill the Great Commission, but their mindset is to continue to try to do so. It is not until Acts 15 that they agree to abandon the Great Commission, Galatians 2 verse 9. When mainstream Christianity does not rightly divide the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2 verse 15, they try to fit the events of Acts 1 to 8 into the current dispensation. A sad consequence of this is that they accuse the apostles of going against God's will. Such is the case here. Christianity says that the persecution of 8 colon 1 came about because the little flock was not going out to the rest of the world with the gospel as Jesus had commanded, and so God had to smoke the apostles out of Jerusalem. A similar argument is given for the choice of Matthias, in 126, as the twelfth apostle. Paul is the twelfth apostle, not Matthias. The apostles were out of the will of God when they chose Matthias, is the argument made by Christianity. However, this goes against scripture, since 124 says that the Lord chose Matthias as the twelfth apostle. The problem is that, by saying the apostles were out of the will of God, Christianity is really saying that the Holy Ghost was out of the will of God. Peter was filled with the Holy Ghost when he spoke in 4, 8. The whole assembly was filled with the Holy Ghost in 431. 6, 5 and 755 both say that Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost. 532 says that the Holy Ghost is only given to those who obey God. Therefore, the apostles must have been obeying God in order to continue to be filled with the Holy Ghost. The real reason the apostles did not go away from Jerusalem was because God did not want them to, and even the persecution of 8 colon 1 would not cause them to deviate from God's instructions. Based on this, we can conclude that, if God wanted the apostles to move on from Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria, they would have been leading the way, just like they had led the little flock in everything in early Acts up to this point. Instead, they stay in Jerusalem, while the rest of the little flock goes to Judea and Samaria, not to move along in. The Great Commission, but to get away from persecution. Therefore, their staying in Jerusalem actually shows their obedience of Jesus' instructions, since they continue to obey in spite of the persecution there. 8 colon 3-4 Saul thought he would stamp out the little flock by putting them into prison. The result, though, was that the gospel spread around all of Israel, 8 colon 1, since they had to keep on the move to avoid being taken by Saul. This is a great proof that Jesus' resurrection was not a hoax. After all, if the disciples stole Jesus' body, they would not have endured persecution for a lie that they told. By the way, the same thing will happen in the tribulation period. The little flock will not have gone over the cities of Israel, till the Son of Man be come, Matthew 10 verse 23. Yet, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come, Matthew 24 verse 14. The way that the gospel goes to the whole world, even though the little flock only travels in Israel, is that they are brought before rulers and kings and the Holy Ghost speaks the gospel through them, as they are brought on trial before the whole world, Mark 13 verses 9 to 11. Therefore, rather than snuffing out the gospel, persecution spreads the gospel. This should also tell us today, in the dispensation of grace, that it is not our job to reach all the nations with the gospel, since that will take place in the tribulation period. 
Therefore, money, given to missions, would be better spent reaching people in the area with the gospel, right division, and other sound doctrine, rather than financing tax-deductible vacations in the name of missions. 8 5 God has set aside the kingdom program. In Matthew 10 verse 5, Jesus told the little flock not to enter into any city of the Samaritans, and here is Philip preaching in the city of Samaria. Although God has judged Israel and the kingdom of God will not come in right now, the gospel of repent and be baptized for the remission of sins is still being preached, since God has not started the dispensation of grace yet. Also, Note that the Philip here is not one of the twelve apostles for they were still at Jerusalem, 8, 1, and did not come to Samaria until after they had received the word of God, 8, 14. 8, 6 God is also still doing miracles through the little flock, since Jews need to see a sign in order to believe, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 22. Basically, Acts 8 records the gospel of the kingdom still being preached. Those believing will still have eternal life in God's kingdom on earth. The difference is that the kingdom is not at hand anymore. Believers will have to wait until the dispensation of grace begins in Acts 9 and ends with the rapture before they are resurrected to live in the kingdom, just like all other Jews saved before them. 8 7 Since they will still have eternal life in the kingdom, God still performs the two signs of the kingdom, 1. Casting out devils, and 2. Healing the sick. 8 9-11 Simon represents apostate Israel. Simon used sorcery, such that all of Samaria thought he was the great power of God. Similarly, apostate Israel used slash will use satanic power to do miracles to bewitch Israel into thinking they represent God. Matthew 7 verses 22 to 23 and 12 27. In 8 colon 18 dash 19, Simon offers the apostles money so that he may be able to give the Holy Ghost to whom he wills. This shows that, even when Satan does miracles, his power is less than God's power. Otherwise, Simon would not have asked for the greater power of the Holy Ghost. An example of this is seen in Pharaoh's magicians. They were able to duplicate some of God's miracles, Exodus 7 verses 10 to 12, 7 colon 20 dash 22, and 8 colon 6 dash 7, but not all of them, Exodus 8 verses 16 to 19. 8.12 All of Samaria gave heed to Simon, 8.9-10, but, then they heard the gospel from Philip and believed that. Similarly, most all of Israel followed the Jewish religious leaders, but some of them left when they heard the gospel. The gospel of the kingdom is to believe and be baptized, Mark 16 verse 16, and that is what happens here which tells us that people are still being saved under the guidelines of Israel's program, even though the kingdom is no longer at hand, Matthew 3 verse 2 and 4 17. 8 13, we know that Simon genuinely believed the gospel, because this verse says that he did, but, then he put money above his belief, such that Peter said, Thy heart is not right in the sight of God, 8 21. This is another proof that the dispensation of grace has not started yet because Simon loses his salvation about as quickly as he received it, while believers, in the dispensation of grace, cannot lose their salvation because they receive the atonement when they believe, Romans 5 verse 11. 8 colon 14 dash 17 The dispensation of grace has not started yet because the apostles had to lay their hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost, whereas today we are sealed with the Holy Spirit when we believe, Ephesians 1 verses 13 to 14. The reason one of the twelve apostles had to lay hands on them to receive the Holy Ghost was because Jesus gave unto them alone the power to remit or retain sins, John 20 verses 22 to 23, because they had the Holy Ghost guiding them to determine if a person has a heart that is right with God. In this way, the apostles know everyone who had saved themselves from this untoward generation, 240, which would receive the wrath of God for using wicked hands to crucify and slay Jesus. 2 to 34-36. 8.15 gives an example of people who have their sins remitted because they have right hearts before God. The example of Simon is an example of a person who does not have his sins remitted because his heart is not right in the sight of God. 8.21. Only the apostles, by the power of God, would know this. After all, in 8.13, we are told that Simon believed and was baptized. 
This is the formula for forgiveness of sins that Peter mentioned in 238, but, when Peter arrives, he determines that Simon's heart is not right in the sight of God, 821, and tells him that he still needs to repent, 822. Only God could know that his heart is not right, and the Holy Ghost lets Peter know that Simon's heart is not right. Therefore, the twelve apostles are necessary to either retain or remit sins so that only those who have right hearts before God receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Today, in the dispensation of grace, the intermediary of the apostles has been eliminated, and God directly gives forgiveness of sin and the Holy Ghost to all those who believe in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for their sins. It is a good thing, too, because man would try to abuse this power just like Simon wants to do here, 8 colon 18 dash 19. 8 colon 18 dash 19 note that Simon did not receive the Holy Ghost, because his heart was not right, 821. He believed, 813, but his belief was like the devil's belief, James 2 verse 19, meaning that, because Simon was already familiar with satanic power, he knew that the power of the Holy Ghost was real. Therefore, he believed in the power, but he did not repent for the remission of sins, 822. As such, he is a type of unbelieving Israel. Israel followed Jesus around for the miracles, John 6 verse 2, but they did not believe the gospel, John 12 verse 37. Similarly, Simon saw the miracles that the apostles performed, 813, but he would not stop trusting in his own self-righteousness in order to enter God's eternal kingdom on earth. Note that Simon did not want the Holy Ghost for himself. He wanted the power to give people the Holy Ghost. He had fooled all of Samaria with his sorcery, 8 9 9-10, and was losing followers to the little flock's preaching of the gospel. Therefore, he tried to regain power over the people by purchasing God's power. Simon tried to buy the power of God, while the apostate, Jewish, religious leaders of Jerusalem tried to kill the power of God. Regardless, both Simon and the Jerusalem religious leaders will perish, 820. 820, the gift of God, 820, in this context, is the Holy Ghost. Peter says that Simon will perish if he tries to purchase God's gift. In the dispensation of grace, we are told that the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Our Lord, Romans 6 verse 23. Yet, people try to purchase this gift by their own works, Ephesians 2 verses 8 to 9. Since a gift cannot be purchased, their works will perish with them in hell, Revelation 20 verses 11 and 14. 8 colon 22 dash 24, Peter told Simon that the way to be forgiven is to repent and pray for God's forgiveness, meaning that he would have to change his mind and trust in God's imputed righteousness, through the gospel of the kingdom, to save him, rather than continuing in his sorcery. However, Simon is not interested in being forgiven. He just wants Peter to pray, so that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. 824. The main thing that Peter told him would come upon him was, Thy money perish with thee. 820. Therefore, all Simon cares about is not losing his money. The love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6 verse 10. And it is Simon's love of money that will keep him from entering the kingdom of God. Note how Peter told Simon to pray God, 822, and Simon told Peter, Pray ye to the Lord for me, 824. Religion goes to a holy leader who prays to God on the person's behalf. Catholics do this by going to a priest who then absolves their sins on behalf of God. By contrast, God's word tells Israel that they themselves may come boldly unto the throne of grace, Hebrews 4 verse 16. Therefore, we see that Simon is a religious person, but he is not a saved person. Finally, note that Peter says, If perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee, 822. Sin is not the act of murder, adultery, lying, etc., but it is the thought of those things. Jesus made this clear in Matthew 5 verses 21 to 32. Christianity wants to make sin an action, rather than a thought, so that they can excuse themselves from their wickedness so that they do not have to believe the gospel, because they will work their way to heaven by their good actions. 8 colon 25 dash 27, here are two, more clues that God has abandoned the kingdom program. 
First, the apostles preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans, 825. In Matthew 10 verses 5 to 6, Jesus told these same apostles not to enter into any city of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. God must have changed programs for them to do this. Second, in Matthew 10 verse 23, Jesus told them that they would not finish going to all the cities of Israel for Jesus' second coming. However, here the angel of the Lord specifically tells Philip to preach the gospel to an Ethiopian man with Ethiopia being far south of Israel. So, God told the little flock in Matthew 10 to preach to Israel only during the seven-year tribulation period, and now God tells Philip to preach to an Ethiopian outside of Israel. Therefore, God has set aside the nation of Israel and the kingdom program to reconcile the earth back to himself and will start the mystery program to reconcile the heavenly places back to himself, beginning with Paul in Acts 9. 829, the Spirit wants Philip to witness to a Gentile? Jesus would not even talk to a Gentile woman after she had spoken to him, because he was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Matthew 15 verse 24. Jesus told his disciples, Go not into the way of the Gentiles, Matthew 10 verse 5. Obviously, something has changed, because the Spirit now sends Philip to a Gentile. This shows that God has moved away from the plan to save Israel and then have saved Israel reach the Gentiles, because Israel has rejected all three members of the Godhead. At the same time, he has not begun the mystery program yet. Therefore, the gospel of the kingdom is still going out. The difference is that the kingdom is no longer at hand for Israel. 8 colon 30-31 The man was reading Isaiah 53 verses 7 to 8, 8 colon 32-33, which foretold of Jesus' death. He does not understand if Isaiah was speaking of himself or of someone else, 834, because no man can tell him. That seems strange since he just came from Jerusalem, 827, the center of the Jewish religion. This man is probably familiar with the promise that all nations will be blessed in Israel, Genesis 12 verse 3, and that Israel is to be a kingdom of priests to the Gentiles, Exodus 19 verses 5 to 6. In fact, in the kingdom, saved Israel will go to the Gentiles with the gospel, Matthew 28 verses 19 to 20, and Gentiles will grab hold of the Jews so that they can go with them to Jerusalem, Zechariah 8 verse 23, to hear the Mosaic law, Isaiah 2 verses 2 to 3. Here, however, this Gentile man, probably knowing that God is the God of Israel and knowing of the events that had happened to Jesus recently, decided to go to Jerusalem all by himself to get guidance from God's people, the Jews. Instead, he left disappointed. No man in Jerusalem could even explain what Isaiah 53 verses 7 to 8 means, even though Jesus Christ fulfilled that prophecy in Jerusalem just one year prior. The Jewish religious leaders who God had set up to lead Israel to God did not point him to Christ. He was left to fend for himself. However, God saw him and sent a member of the little flock to teach him the truth that Jesus died to save the world, John 3 verse 16 and gave him the gospel of the kingdom so that he may have eternal life. Thank God that today, in the dispensation of grace, we do not ever have to look to a man to guide us into the truth of God's word, because we have the Holy Spirit to teach us the things that are freely given to us of God. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12 8 colon 32 33 The man went to Israel, and Israel could not tell him what the Jewish scriptures meant. Note that this of Isaiah 53 verses 7 to 8 leaves out the last line, which reads, For the transgression of my people was he stricken. That is because God will soon reveal to the Apostle Paul that Jesus gave himself a ransom for all, 1 Timothy 2 verse 6, not just for the many of Israel, Matthew 20 verse 28. Therefore, the gospel is going out to the Gentiles now, including this Ethiopian eunuch. His judgment was taken away means that Jesus was not given a fair judgment by being killed. Who shall declare his generation? Means that the generation of vipers, known as the Jewish religious leaders, was busy peddling doctrines of devils all over the world, Matthew 23 verses 15 and 33, instead of declaring the generation of Jesus Christ, Matthew 1 verse 1, for salvation. 
The answer to the question in Israel's program, then, is a nation, the little flock. Bringing forth the fruits thereof, Matthew 21 verse 43, will declare his generation, as seen here by Philip speaking with this Ethiopian, who could not learn of the generation of Jesus Christ in Jerusalem. 835 The scholars and doctors of law could not tell this man what this scripture meant, but Philip could, because he believed God's word. So, too, today, the seminary professors and highbrow pastors are too busy pushing their own doctrine and philosophies to teach what the word of God says. You have to go to a Bible believer to hear the truth of God's word from someone else. Like Philip does here, it is as simple as opening the scriptures and teaching them, because the scriptures testify of Jesus Christ, giving life to those who believe them, John 5 verse 39. Note that this verse says that, Philip opened his mouth. Luke 21 verse 15 says, I will give you a mouth and wisdom. Mark 13 verse 11 says, Whatsoever shall be given you in that hour, that speak ye, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Ghost. Therefore, we are probably told that Philip opened his mouth to show that the Holy Ghost was speaking the truth of God's word through him to this eunuch. By the way, Jesus does the same thing in Matthew 5 verse 2. 8 colon 36 37 These two verses are further proof that the gospel of the kingdom is still being preached at this time. The gospel of the kingdom is to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. 238 The fact that the eunuch asks Philip to baptize him shows us that Philip must have shared the gospel of the kingdom with the man. Philip did not initiate the baptism himself, probably because he knew that the man was a Gentile, which made him a little uneasy since God had sent the little flock to the Jews only. However, since the angel of the Lord, 826, led Philip to this man, he relents and baptizes him once he knows he believes. By the way, modern Bible translations completely omit 837. Funny how they omit complete verses in the New Testament, but they do not omit genealogy in the Old Testament. That is because they do not mind you struggling over the pronunciation of complicated names, but they do not want you to know the clear message that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, 837. 8, 38 39. Incidentally, Philip would have sprinkled water upon the man, rather than dunking him, since Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean. Just like Jesus shared with the two men in Luke 24. And he vanished out of their sight, Luke 24 verse 31, the Spirit of the Lord took Philip away once this man was baptized. Note that the Spirit waited until after the man was baptized, because the eunuch was not saved until that point. 840, with the kingdom no longer being at hand, the gospel goes to other cities so that people may be saved and enter God's kingdom when it does finally come, after the tribulation period is over. 9 God saves Saul, Paul and begins the dispensation of grace. At the same time, God is not done with Peter yet, as Jews are still being saved through miracles done by him. Mind colon one here is Satan's man, Saul, going out to kill members of the little flock, just like apostate Israel will be trying to gather up members of the believing remnant to bring to the Antichrist to be killed during the last half of the tribulation period, Matthew 10 verse 21, Revelation 13 verse 15 and 20 colon 4. The last time we saw Saul was at the stoning of Stephen, 758. Since Saul was consenting unto his death, 8 colon 1, it is reasonable to assume that he had a say so in Jesus' death, just one year prior. Therefore, Saul is now continuing on his rampage to arrest and kill all Jews who go against the Jewish religion by believing God's word. 9 colon 2 Saul's authority to arrest members of the little flock comes from the high priest, 9 colon 1. The letters, to arrest believers, are written to the synagogues in Damascus. Since the dispensation of grace and the body of Christ have not begun yet, believing Israel is still following their program. As such, they are required to obey the Mosaic Law, Matthew 23 verses 2 to 3, which means that they are still going to the synagogues on the Sabbath, even though they are being persecuted, 8 colon 1. Therefore, they obeyed God, although that obedience could have caused their death.
This method of arresting the little flock shows that the persecution is coming from within the Jewish religion. Persecution of believers always comes from religious people, because non-religious unbelievers do not care if someone believes the gospel or not. But, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 verse 16, which includes salvation from religion. Today, in the United States, we also have persecution from the government, but that government is trying to enforce their religions of science, atheism, agnosticism, pleasure, etc. Therefore, even governmental persecution today is really religious persecution. The same is true for the little flock, because it is by the authority of Jewish religion that Saul came to Damascus to arrest and kill believers. 22, 4-5 9, 3, there shined round about him a light from heaven, 9, 3. This light blinded him for three days, 9, 8, 9. Saul, and everyone with him, heard a voice, but saw no man, 9, 4, 7. All of these facts lead to the conclusion that Jesus Christ came to Saul, not in bodily form, but as the true light, John 1, verse 9. He was surrounding Saul as the light, such that his voice came from the light, and not from heaven. Hearing a voice on earth, but seeing no one, left Saul's companion speechless, 9, 7. 9, 4, 5, the first, two things God tells Saul are that Saul is persecuting him and that his name is Jesus. Right away, then, Saul knows that Jesus is Lord, which means he also must be the Messiah. That means that Saul's going about to imprison the believing remnant is going against God's people. Saul probably already had a suspicion that this was the case. After all, he knew the Jewish religion very well, Galatians 1 verse 14, which meant that he also knew the Old Testament. Note that Saul says, Who art thou, Lord? He knows that the Lord is speaking to him, and he is saying in his mind, I just know that he is going to say that he is Jesus. The reason we know this is that Saul already knew who God is. He is the I Am, Exodus 3 verse 14. Therefore, there was no sense in asking for his name unless Jesus is really the Lord after all. Pricks were used to keep animals in line. Thus, kicking against the pricks means that Saul was rebelling against God, as a brute beast would, 2 Peter 2 verse 12. Having been brought up in the Jewish religion, Saul had the opportunity to know the God of the Old Testament and the prophecies of the Messiah and how Jesus fulfilled those prophecies. By trying to kill the believing remnant, Saul was doing the opposite of what he should have been doing. Therefore, he was kicking against the pricks that God had placed around him, the pricks of God's word to keep him in line. He was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious to God's people, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13. Just like the Lord called Saul to come out of the Jewish religion to be saved, in the tribulation period, the Lord will call his people to come out of the Babylonian religious system of the Antichrist, Revelation 18 verse 4. Speaking of the Antichrist, based upon Saul's background, if Jesus had not started the dispensation of grace at this time, Saul would have been the Antichrist. What is great about that is that it shows that God's grace is sufficient to save the vilest man ever to live which means that NL1 is too steeped in sin not to receive the gift of eternal life. 9 colon 6 James 2 verse 19 says that the devils tremble at God, because they know he has the power to destroy them. So, too, Saul trembled. However, Saul was also astonished. As a zealous Jew, Galatians 1 verse 14, Saul knew that, if Jesus is Lord, he should have been destroyed. If Jesus is Lord, then he was sitting at the Father's right hand until the Father made his enemies his footstool, Psalm 110 verse 1. Since Saul had crucified Jesus by wicked hands, 223, he was Jesus' enemy. Therefore, when Jesus came to him, Scripture, up to this point, would have Saul believed that he would have been killed. When Jesus' wrath does come upon this earth, Revelation 6 verses 15 to 17 shows everyone running to caves to try to escape his wrath. Saul probably tried to run also, but he could not because Jesus had encased him in his light. Therefore, Saul is astonished that he is still alive, and asks, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 9, 6. Now, you may wonder how Saul was saved in the first place. 
After all, Jesus said, Whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. Matthew 12 verse 32. Since Stephen was filled with the Holy Ghost, 755, and Saul was consenting unto his death, 8 1, Saul committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost. The reason Saul was forgiven was, because he did so in ignorance. How do we know? 1 Timothy 1 verse 13 tells us so, who was before a blasphemer, but I obtained mercy, because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. This is not unlike the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The law says that the murderer of an innocent man is worthy of death, Numbers 35 colon 30, but he is not worthy of death if he did it in ignorance, Deuteronomy 19 verses 4 to 6. This means that Israel was worthy of death for killing Jesus Christ, except that they did it in ignorance, 3 colon 15 17, which means that they have an opportunity to be saved, 3 19. Therefore, because Saul blasphemed the Holy Ghost in ignorance, he obtained mercy from the Lord. 9 colon 8 Saul must have closed his eyes when the light came. Now, he is blind, which symbolizes his spiritual blindness in following the Jewish religion, Matthew 15 verses 12 to 14. 9 colon 9 Saul's being blind and not eating or drinking for three days is also a picture of the nation of Israel who were blind to seeing God during the three years of Jesus' ministry, Luke 13 verses 6 to 7, he was with them on earth, and were not spiritually fed by him. 9.10 This is not the same Ananias as in 5 colon 1, because that one was killed for lying to the Holy Ghost, 5 colon 5. 9.11 How appropriate that Saul is now on straight street, since the Lord had set him straight. Since Saul could not see, eat, or drink, 9 colon 9, he prayed. Today, regardless of physical limitations, all members of the body of Christ can pray. 9 12, although he could not physically see, Saul, in his mind, saw a vision from God of Ananias coming to him and giving him sight. This would be another confirmation to Saul that God has called him. More importantly, Jesus, the One he persecuted, has called him, and he will give him spiritual sight, in addition to physical sight. This is seen in 917, where Ananias said that he was sent so that Paul might receive his sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. 9.13-14 Ananias is a man of God in that he obeys God in spite of Saul's reputation. Saul was being groomed by Satan to be the Antichrist, and God calls Ananias to come to Saul. This is a picture of apostate Israel in the tribulation period. They need the little flock to come to them with the gospel in order to save them from Satan's clutches in his Babylonian system. 9.15 Satan's chosen vessel becomes God's chosen vessel. I am sure Satan was upset when this happened. The man he was grooming to be the Antichrist becomes God's man to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. Saul will also preach to the Jews, and when he goes into a city, he preaches to the Jews first, 1316. That is because the Holy Ghost, through Stephen, asked the Lord to give Israel a chance to be saved in the dispensation of grace, 7 hours 60 minutes. Also, the little flock begins preaches Paul's gospel, but to the Jews only, 1119. Since the little flock does not preach to the Gentiles and Paul will stop preaching to the Jews at the close of Acts, 28, 28, Paul is specifically called the Apostle of the Gentiles, Romans 11 verse 13, even though he also temporarily preaches to Jews in Acts 9 to 28. 9 16 Although the tribulation period has been put on hold due to Israel not believing the gospel of the kingdom, Paul will go through great sufferings himself, because he will be proclaiming the truth of the gospel in Satan's world, 2 Corinthians 4 verse 4. We are not told when God revealed to Paul the things he would suffer for the Lord. He may have told him during the three years he was in Damascus after he returned from Arabia, Galatians 1 verses 17 to 18, which coincides with the many days of 923. In any event, Paul gives a list in 2 Corinthians 11 verses 23 to 28 of just some of the things he suffered, including being beaten five times by religious Jews, three times by rods, once being stoned and left for dead, and three times being shipwrecked, just to name a few. And, Paul still ministered for years after he wrote that list. 
However, God was fair. To Saul, because he showed him beforehand how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. 916. Therefore, he was forewarned, yet he still preached the gospel. Before Acts 9, Paul was zealous for the Jewish religion. Galatians 1 verse 14. Now, he will be zealous for the gospel of the grace of God. 2024. 917 Ananias believes God such that he goes into Saul's house and immediately calls him brother. Since he calls him brother and Saul has been praying, Saul must have already repented. But, he still needs to be water baptized in order to receive the Holy Ghost. 238. Saul also needs to receive physical sight. Therefore, God sends Ananias to do those two things. 918 Both Saul's physical and spiritual eyes have now been opened. He knew all about the Jewish traditions, and he followed those traditions to the point of killing members of the believing remnant, 22, 4. Saul has repented or changed his mind about following those traditions and trusts in God's imputed righteousness through God's law covenant with Israel to save him. Therefore, he is baptized, receiving remission of sins according to the gospel of the kingdom and receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, 238. This places Saul in God's eternal kingdom on earth as part of saved Israel. Paul was also later saved by the mystery gospel and placed into God's eternal kingdom in heaven as a member of the body of Christ, but that did not happen at this time. We know this for two reasons. The first reason is that the pattern followed by Ananias is the pattern followed in early acts for people to be saved into Israel's program. A person needed to repent and be baptized in order to be saved and then he would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, 238. One of the two reasons God sent Ananias was so that Saul would be filled with the Holy Ghost, 917. In other words, Ananias had to preach the gospel of repent and be baptized for the remission of sins to Saul. Saul believed this gospel and was water baptized in 918, receiving the Holy Ghost. The second reason we know that Saul was saved under Israel's program at this time is by what he says in Galatians 1 verses 11 to 12. There he says, The gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was he taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 13 says, After that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. In other words, a person receives the Holy Ghost after believing the gospel. Since Ananias was sent by God for Saul to be filled with the Holy Ghost, 917, Ananias must have been the one who gave Saul the gospel. Since Saul never received the mystery gospel of man, neither was he taught it, the gospel that Ananias gave to Saul must have been the gospel of the kingdom. You cannot say that Saul received the gospel from Jesus Christ before this, because scripture does not record that. Saul asked Jesus Christ, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? 9,6. The Lord's response was that he would be told in the city what he needs to do. In other words, the Lord sent Ananias to Saul with the gospel of the kingdom message. Compare this with 237 when men asked Peter, what shall we do? And Peter gave them the gospel of the kingdom in 238. In other words, the answer to the question of what to do is to believe the gospel, which means that Ananias must have shared the gospel with Saul. Since Saul did not receive the mystery gospel from man, the gospel Ananias gave Saul was the gospel of the kingdom. This means that Saul was saved into Israel's program, not the body of Christ at this time. Granted, the kingdom program had been set aside, and God's kingdom was no longer in the at hand phase, but salvation by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection had not been revealed yet. Therefore, the gospel of the kingdom is still the method of salvation, it is just that the kingdom has been placed on hold. As mentioned before, Saul had rejected the gospel of the kingdom to the point of even ordering Stephen's stoning, 758 and 8, colon 1. However, he did it ignorantly in unbelief, therefore, he obtained mercy from God, 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, just like Jews, in Acts 3, obtained mercy for their sin of ignorance, 3, 17-19. By contrast, the nation of Israel, as a whole, with the stoning of Stephen, had committed the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, for which there is no forgiveness, so that the nation, as a
whole, have been set aside by God and the dispensation of grace will soon start. Matthew 12 verses 31 to 34. But, God offers forgiveness under the kingdom program to Saul because of his sin of ignorance. Once the mystery is revealed to Saul, he will also be saved by believing in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins, since it is in Paul first that Jesus Christ shewed forth all long suffering, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe to life everlasting, 1 Timothy 1 verse 16. Therefore, Paul is saved under both Gospels, just like Abraham was saved under both Gospels, Genesis 15 verse 6 and Romans 4 verses 2 to 3, justification by faith alone, Genesis 22 verse 9 and James 2 verse 21, justification by faith plus works. This explains why Saul was water baptized here, even though water baptism has nothing to do with the gospel of the grace of God that Paul preached, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 17. 19 Because the book of Acts is written to Israel, the details given, here, are only what are important to Israel. Because the book of Galatians is written to the body of Christ, the details given, there, are only what are important to the body of Christ. Therefore, merging the two accounts together to determine what happens now is an educated guess. Paul says, in Galatians 1 verses 15 to 18 that, once he received the mystery gospel, he immediately, conferred not with flesh and blood. Rather, he went into Arabia, and returned again unto Damascus. He then went up to Jerusalem after three years. The book of Acts never records him going to Arabia and returning to Damascus. It just shows him in Damascus, and then he goes to Jerusalem due to being persecuted. 9.22-26 It is my belief that, the spiritual meat, of 9.19, is the gift of the Holy Ghost. He is then strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, Ephesians 3 verse 16, which would be understanding that the Old Testament scriptures show Jesus as the Messiah, which means that he had to die for the sins of Israel at his first coming. He knew the Old Testament through the tradition of the fathers. Now, he learns the Old Testament through the eyes of faith. 920 If my comments in 919 are true, Paul did not preach Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as atonement for sins in 920. That is the gospel of the grace of God, which is part of the mystery, and Jesus Christ has not revealed the mystery to him yet. I make this conclusion because Galatians 1 verses 15 to 18 says that, once Paul received the mystery gospel, he immediately conferred not with flesh and blood. Rather, he went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. However, in 9,19-20, he was with the disciples in Damascus and preached in the synagogues Christ is the Son of God. Therefore, he is preaching the gospel of the kingdom, which is to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. He did preach Christ, as this verse says, but he preached Christ as bad news, just like Peter had done in Acts 2 and 3. The bad news is that the Jews crucified their Messiah. By Paul's preaching Christ as the Son of God, they can see that they are subject to God's wrath upon them if they do not repent. The good news is that salvation is still available to them by abandoning Jewish tradition, going back to the law covenant, and being water baptized. I think the reason that Paul has not learned the mystery gospel yet is because there had to be a transition period to show the little flock that he has converted and is one of them. Once the amazement of his conversion wears off, 921, Jesus Christ then commits a dispensation of the gospel, 1 Corinthians 9 verse 17, unto him. 922 this verse says that Saul increased the more in strength, which tells me that this refers to the time that Jesus Christ revealed the mystery gospel to him. He then went to Arabia to learn the doctrine related to this new dispensation, thereby increasing the more in strength. He then returned to Damascus and confounded the Jews that Jesus is very Christ, 922. In preaching Israel's program in 920, he amazed the Jews that he was now preaching the same message that the little flock had been preaching. But, then, in 922, he had the new information of the mystery. Gospel that these religious Jews had never heard before, such that they were confounded. In other words, religious Jews already had their arguments against Israel's program, but they had never heard the mystery. 
Therefore, they were confounded, not able to respond to this new information from God by the mouth of Paul. 9,23-24 Since Paul goes to Jerusalem in 926, the three years that he spends in Damascus before going to Jerusalem, see Galatians 1 verses 17 to 18, had to have taken place before 926. Therefore, the many days of 923 must refer to these three years. This makes sense in light of 1 Kings 2 verses 38 to 39, where many days also equals three years. This means that Paul preached the mystery gospel and doctrine in Damascus for three years in 923. The religious Jews then sought to kill him, much like Jesus preached the kingdom message for about three years before he was crucified. This shows that, even with the grace that God has extended to Israel with the mystery gospel, they have again chosen to continue to follow their traditions for they are now trying to kill their former leader, Saul. This begins the diminishing away of Israel as they reject the gospel of grace from 922-28-29. Again, the book of Acts does not make the distinction between the change in programs here because, as far as God is concerned, he is still trying to give eternal life to Israel. He is just doing so, now, with a different gospel than before. 925 Unlike Jesus and Stephen, the Jewish religious leaders were unsuccessful in killing Saul, since he is God's chosen vessel to spread the gospel to the Gentiles. 915. But, Saul had to become the first basket case in order to survive. 926, this verse is yet another clue that God has set aside Israel's program. In 5, 3, Peter knows that Ananias is lying to him because he has insight from the Holy Ghost to either retain or remit people's sins. John 20 verses 22 to 23. Now, however, this same Peter does not believe that Saul is a disciple, even though Saul has just spent the last three years preaching the gospel in Damascus. Why doesn't Peter know? because he has lost the power from the Holy Ghost, too. Let people in or keep people out of God's kingdom, Matthew 16 verses 18 to 19, because God's kingdom program has been put on hold in favor of the mystery program just revealed to Paul. 927, the Holy Ghost does not show the twelve disciples that Paul is saved. It is Barnabas who has to show them, showing that God has set aside the kingdom program and has begun the dispensation of grace. 928 Paul says, in Galatians 1 verses 18 to 19 that, when he did go to Jerusalem, the only apostles he saw were Peter and James. Yet, 928 says that Paul came in and went out with the apostles in Jerusalem. This may mean that the visit, mentioned in Galatians, happened before the one in 926. However, there does not seem to be another visit, especially since Galatians 2 verse 1 implies that the next time he went to Jerusalem was 14 years later. Therefore, what probably happened was that Barnabas tried to get the apostles to accept Paul, but only Peter did. Although Paul went in and out with the apostles, they probably would not speak to him, since they were afraid that he would try to arrest and kill them. 9.29-30 We are not told who these Grecians are. But the context seems to indicate that they are part of the little flock in Jerusalem, especially in light of 6, 1. If that is the case, then there are even members of the little flock who want to kill Saul as he speaks boldly in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is because these Grecians believed a different gospel. They repented and were water baptized for the remission of sins, 238, while Paul, having already received the mystery from Jesus Christ, was preaching salvation by trusting in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15 verses 3 to 4. Paul was preaching a new gospel, and these Grecians were not open to the idea that someone could be saved in a different manner than they were saved. Therefore, they become the enemies of the cross just like the Jewish religious leaders were, and just like the apostles were, except for Peter and James, Galatians 1 verses 18 to 19. In fact, in Paul's epistles, Judaizers, preaching salvation by faith, plus works, are seen often. If Paul was not preaching a different gospel, members of the little flock would not be trying to kill him. However, some members of the little flock did believe that Jesus Christ had given Paul a new, 
different gospel, such that they protected him from being killed. These believers are called the brethren, who are probably sick Jews of the little flock. By the way, if the kingdom program were still going on, this protection would not have been necessary, as the Holy Ghost would have struck these Grecians dead, as he did with Ananias and Sapphira, 5, 5, 10. 9.31 The rest came about in the churches when they got rid of those opposing Paul. Then, they were multiplied as people began to believe the gospel of the grace of God given to Paul. We see this in Galatians 1 verses 22 to 24, as Paul went to the churches in Judea. Because the apostles had nothing to do with Paul, these Judean churches did not know Paul by face, Galatians 1 verse 22. However, they knew that they could believe the message that Paul preached because they feared the Lord, 931, meaning that they believed God's word to Paul, and they were comforted by the Holy Ghost, 931, meaning that he strengthened their souls in the persecution that their own flesh brought them for believing God's word. Thus, we see the church, the body of Christ, multiplying under Paul, much like we saw the church, the bride of Christ, multiply under Peter, 6 colon 7. 932 Although the kingdom program has been set aside and Paul has been chosen by God, 915, to dispense the mystery gospel to all men, Ephesians 3 verses 7 to 9, the book of Acts focus is on the nation of Israel. Therefore, the narrative goes back to Peter now, who must have known about the change in dispensation, since Paul had visited with him for 15 days, Galatians 1 verse 18. Perhaps Peter passed throughout all quarters, 932, to inform saved Israel of the dispensational change, and that they were still subject to the rules of the prophecy dispensation, 1014, 2120, since they were saved as part of that program, 